Hi, and welcome to the ACNC's March webinar, which will be looking at charities and corporate partnerships. My name is Chris Richards, and I'm from the ACNC's education team. And today we have a very special guest with us, corporate partnerships consultant, Linda Garnett. Hi, Linda. Hi, Chris. It's great to be here. And um, I'm told that today is the International Day of Happiness. So I hope mm. all of you out there are having a great day too. Happiness, yes. Smiles everywhere. Um, thanks for coming along to Linda. Um, to everyone out there, you may recognise Linda from our Charity Chat podcast uh, on the corporate partnerships topic that we did uh, a little while back. Was last year? Oh, I think so. It doesn't time fly. Yeah, it does. Um, so this is a great opportunity for us to catch up again and explore the topic uh, in some further detail. Before we launch into the webinar proper, we're just going to get through our usual uh, preliminaries. So we'll whip through these relatively quickly. If you've got any troubles with the audio for the webinar, you can try listening through your phone. Uh, you can call the number listed in the email you'll have received when you signed up. Uh, and you will be asked to put in an access code and away you go. You can also ask a question at any time through the webinar by using the tools in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. We've got uh, colleagues Matt and Bree ready to respond to any of the questions you might have. Now we'll try and answer all the questions that come through during the webinar, but depending on how we go uh, and how time goes, we may not be able to get to everyone. So if your question isn't answered or you've got a further question you want to ask, feel free to send us an email via education at acnc.gov.au and we'll respond there. We will endeavour to allow for some Q&A time at the end of the presentation. So if you wanted to watch the presentation and then save your question until the end, that's fine as well. As always, we're recording the webinar and the recording as well as the uh, transcript and the presentation slides, they will be published on the ACNC website in the coming days. Any websites or links that are mentioned in the webinar, uh, you don't have to scramble and madly scribble stuff down. Um, we'll be sending out a follow-up email in the next day or two with uh, that information for you. And uh, lastly, we value your feedback. So if there's any suggestions you have for how we can improve our webinars, um, let us know in the short survey at the end of today's session or send us an email to the previously mentioned email address with your comments. So, there we go. This is what we're going to cover today. Generally speaking, what we're going to do is we're going to try and uh, maybe track a, a bit of an engagement cycle when it comes to uh, corporate partnerships. So we're going to start with a look at the definition of what a corporate partnership is. Uh, then we'll discuss some of the starting points for charities wishing to embark on a partnership journey. We'll look at choosing and approaching a suitable partner, how charities can maintain and build on a partnership, and also how the end game for a partnership can play out, uh, how things get wound up, exit points and that sort of stuff. Along the way, we'll share some partnership stories and advice. Linda, in particular, can draw on some great experiences there. Uh, and we'll answer some questions uh, with any luck and explore some aspects of the, of the topic. So, we'll start at the start. What's a corporate partnership? Basic definition is pretty plain. A corporate partnership in this context is an arrangement between a charity and a, a business or a corporate. But really, we should be looking at a few more detailed aspects of the arrangement when defining a partnership. And key amongst them is, I guess, this idea of a, a three-layered benefit, isn't it, Linda? lots of different ways of looking at the benefits, but probably three main perspectives, Chris. Uh, one of which is what, what the charity needs and wants and where a corporate partner can actually fit. The secondly, and most importantly, is the what does the corporate actually want in return? Because especially the listed corporates, they're, um, they're tasked with returning some value to shareholders. Yeah. So they have to make some choices between do they invest in your, your charity or your particular community program, yes. or do they do something else with shareholders' money? So there is a quid pro quo, um, but the thing that binds it all together is the bigger social impact you can achieve together. Hmm. And often what we're seeing with businesses of all sizes at the moment is they're really increasingly focused on that bigger social impact. So not just can I fund your program or can I sponsor your event, but what can we actually do together? So hmm. it's a nice kind of triangle of how it all, how it, you, know, you should think about it in terms of a, a benefit to the charity, to the corporate and the community at large because they're all equally important. Yeah. And that's sort of, um, I guess, a sign or, or a, yeah, I guess a sign of, of a well-functioning or a high-functioning partnership in a way, the, the idea of 
benefit to corporate, benefit to organisation for charity, that sort of stuff, but benefit to that wider community as well, isn't it? Absolutely, and it's, you know, I always think about it as, uh, you know, when you turn up to a first date, you don't you don't ask Chris whether whether you've got um, um, you know, how much you earn and um, where you work and can I borrow your car. You actually think about what can you offer to them and, and what can you actually achieve together. Yeah, yeah. All right. As we say here, um, now, the corporate partnership, it's more than just a basic device to attract money from a corporate. Uh, a key consideration should be towards the long-term value a partnership has for you and for any prospective partner. Now, we mention here uh, the term long-term value. Um, how important is it for, we'll say a charity, to have at least something that's verging towards medium term to long term when it comes to their outlook? Well, if you think about businesses, and it's, whether it's large or small businesses, they have a longer term view of where they're going. So um, it would be great if the charity can actually describe, you know, what is that long term value of that relationship? And also, things don't happen overnight. Yeah. So if you're running a community program or let's say you're, you're working with uh, disadvantaged young people and helping them transition to work, it's not going to happen overnight. So it's good to manage their expectations and bring them along, bring the partner along the whole journey. Yeah. And I often talk about this as, as a relationship rather than a one night stand. <laughs> so you're, you're really building for that longer term, um, you know, a longer marriage. And if you do so, then the potential for a transformational impact is so much bigger, not just for um, the corporate, but also for the charity itself. And we saw a great example of this when uh, there was a uh, one of the breast cancer charities working with um, a large retailer, and it started off really small. They started off simply by offering them some office space. Yeah, yeah. And then the relationship grew. They got to know each other. They started to do things together. And then 10 years later, it's worth about $15 million and they've done everything from you know, sales of products, calls related marketing, some joint policy and advocacy, and the business um, has um, one of the key people on the charity's board. Yeah. So that's the value of a long-term investment in the transformation. And also it's gonna be a bit of work to actually get the partnership on board, so it's gonna take a few months. So yeah. it's not something you can, you can turn around overnight so have that long-term three to five year view of the value you can have. And, and I think you mentioned very aptly there the idea of uh, investment or that term investment. This isn't just a throw some money at something just to come together randomly and have a bit of a chat over a cup of tea. It is an investment, an investment of, of resources of time and, and that sort of stuff too. And that's how it should be looked at, shouldn't it? That's right. And it doesn't mean it's onerous and it doesn't mean that's that's only for the larger charities with lots and lots of resources. It's it's really an investment in the relationship to get to know each other, uh, what's important to both parties and what's going to make that sort of transformational piece for the community at large. Yeah. All right. Quick little diversion off a slight side street. Um, some statistics there up on the screen. Uh, now, these probably point to the fact that um, corporate's involvement in, in partnerships continues to grow. Uh, the Giving Australia report uh, for 2016 found that the percentage of corporates involved in partnerships with not-for-profits had grown quite significantly from 17% in 2005 to 44% in 2016. Um, the report also found that large corporates were more likely to be involved in partnerships, which probably isn't surprising, but that there was evidence that small to medium sized enterprises were becoming increasingly involved. How does that mesh with your your experience, Linda? Is, is that sort of ring true? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And if you go back to that same Giving Australia report, you'll notice the amount uh, the amount of corporate giving mm. was about $9 billion yep. from the larger corporates. Then you look at the other side of the equation and the amount of giving from SMEs was $8 billion. Yeah, yeah. So it almost rivals its sort of bigger cousins. Mm. So that's a, a massive amount of uh, opportunity there that's probably going begging. And I know that a lot of charities, when they think about corporate partners, think about the top 200 listed companies. Yeah. Now, you don't all want to be fishing in the same small pond. <laughs> it's pretty competitive it with is. those when you're actually missing all the rest of the pyramid, not just the top of the pyramid. Yeah. And I find that um, SMEs are very strongly philanthropic, 
but they're often owner managed. So they don't have a big CSR department like, you know, your big banks or your big miners and so mm. forth. That means there are less layers of decision making for you, which is a, yeah. a huge advantage. So you can actually get straight to the person who has control of the budget and the decisions a lot quicker. Um, and in some instances, um, we, I'll give you an example of a Queensland based charity that was really struggling because it was focusing on the biggest, largest, yeah. listed corporates yeah. and we talked to them about the SME opportunity and kind of a light bulb went off <laughs> and they went pursuing SMEs that were based specifically around in the Queensland area mm. and I saw them at a conference a couple of weeks ago and they came bowling up to me and said guess what we've now got 10 of the largest SMEs in Queensland and they're so much more generous oh, wow. and it took a lot less time yeah and we're really, really happy with it because we're just getting much better results. Yeah. So that really worked for them because they were only focused in one state and they were struggling with sort of, you know, the big multinationals. They weren't really making much, much cut through. That, that sort of small to medium enterprise too, there's, I guess, a, a greater opportunity or a greater likelihood that they are going to be more locally or regionally focused than a larger, we'll say multinational or even just national um, if you are a, a charity sort of uh, specifically working in a particular say geographic area um, approaching a small to medium enterprise that is working in your area is more likely to make a bit of sense isn't it and you find that SMEs are very focused on their local community yeah and very in tune with it so they can often bring insights and skills and networks that you don't have so it's not just about um, funding and fundraising, and I know we'll we'll talk about that a bit further, um, but there are other opportunities with that. So of that $8 billion, there's a large slice of the pie that I'd love everyone to think about um, because they might be missing out on it. Yeah. Now, we, we preempted that one a bit. Uh, we've got some partnership models here just for a little bit of reference. This is a very, I guess, quick run through. We can go through it in a little bit more detail. These are basic examples. Um, obviously, things like volunteering and, and staff engagement from a corporate standpoint, uh, in-kind support through goods or services, uh, resources. Um, pro bono support is another relatively common uh, model or, or uh, way of involvement. Sponsorships as well. A um, couple of other ones. Um, use of premises or sharing of premises, uh, infrastructure um, and place-based solutions um, and, and opportunities presented by things like mentoring and training and, and uh, I guess skills-based type of stuff. Um, particularly those last two bullet points, they're maybe not ones that spring to mind straight away for a, for a charity when it comes to partnerships, are they? But they're ones that are well worth looking at, well worth considering. I think that's right, Chris. And often when people mention partnerships, they use that almost alternatively with sponsorships and think yeah. that they're the same thing. So yeah. um, sponsorships are only one slice of the pie. It's not the whole pie. Mm. And if you've, you're set up to have a very specific, almost commercial vehicle, like a, a large event, um, like some of the football clubs and so forth are, um, where it's more of a commercial arrangement, then absolutely a sponsorship works for you. But in a lot of cases with the charities and community organisations we talk to, they're really selling intangibles. Yeah, yeah. Really selling intangibles. So it's a lot harder to do that. So what I encourage people to do is think about um, all the other things a business can do for you in a partnership. It's not just about funding and fundraising. Yeah. Um, it's not just about sponsorships or that, that could be part of the mix. Um, infrastructure training and skills. Uh, a really um, a really vital access to skills that a corporate have that you couldn't access or it will probably cost you far too much absolutely to, yeah. to the access cost yourself. becomes an issue then yes yeah. so I'm thinking of uh, a charity that has a helpline for um, children at risk mm. and they built their business on the back of a partnership with a telecommunications company mm. who helped them build their platform who brought all of their digital expertise lent them their skills, lent them some of their staff to ongoing mentor and train them and, and then continually upgrade the platform. And they, they couldn't actually run it without um, the support of the partner in that case. So yeah. that, that really anchored their business and that was very much skills and their platform um, 
not so much their products, but their their expertise, yeah. which is really important. Yeah. And also, when we mentioned the SMEs beforehand, that place-based approach is really helpful for some community organisations. So we worked with um, uh, a series of organisations out in the far southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Yeah have a very like, big growth corridor, lots of young families who are quite isolated and the risk of children being disadvantaged. And they wanted to make the place a more child friendly and child accessible place. So how did they do that? They worked with some of the local businesses to be able to transform their high street businesses, whether it's the cafes, the libraries, the retailers, etc., to make them more family friendly, make them more accessible and be another way of families accessing information and support. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of actually using the power of the whole community in partnership to achieve what you wanted for the community. Yeah. All right. Now, getting started. So we'll get to the, I guess, the nitty gritty of, of I, I guess we call it partnership engagement. Um, the first thing we'll cover here is obviously getting started, how how, uh, how to get things rolling. Um, really though, some of the some of the work, some of the basic work is is often done before you hit the the big green play button, which you can see up there on the on the screen. You as a as a charity, you have to lay some foundations, some good foundations. Um, you have to be able to consider your your charity situation as well and, and know where you're at. Um, and as we say here, we've got, um, in considering your situation, you know, have an idea, have some familiarity about the aims and direction of, of your charity, of your organisation. Um, have a bit of an idea and, and do a bit of self-examination about what you've got, uh, what you can offer, um, how you might be unique, how you might be different, how you can distinguish yourself um, from other charities, other other organisations, um, and also it's it's well worth having a bit of a think at this stage, even early on, about uh, your your limits uh, and perhaps your your no go zones. We'll mention no go zones again uh, a little bit a little bit later, but um, the, these sorts of things at the start are very important to get straight, aren't they, Linda? The foundations are so important, Chris. I can't emphasise this enough because I get lots of questions from people saying, where do I start? Is it too hard? Shall I just start making some calls? <laughs> yeah. And that's that's a recipe for not a great deal of success, to yeah. be honest, and a lot of frustration. So the first part of call really is to start within your own organisation, really getting to understand the why. Like what, why do you need a corporate partner? What do, you, what do you really want them to do? Yeah. Where are the gaps you need them to fill or the, the vision that you actually have that can't be fulfilled without some help? Yeah. So really understanding your strategy and your priorities and where you're going. Because if you can't tell the, the story of where am I going in the next five years, why would someone else come along with the journey with you? Absolutely you, you just, right. You yeah. just look like a tourist without a map. Yes, yes. So understanding yourself and where you're going is really, really important and your strengths and, and what makes you different because, you know, 54,000 plus registered charities, mm. yeah, there's a fair bit of competition out there. So yeah. how can you tell your story about why you're different or why you're special? Mm. It may not be unique, but there may be an aspect that makes you, you know, particularly strong in some areas. Mm. It distinguishes you from the rest of the pack. Um, so that's an internal piece about getting to know yourself and your offering uh, that will really be the anchor point yeah. because you're really looking for strategic alignment between your charity and a particular business. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get to know your, your prospective partner's business and you're going to ask them lots of questions about it um, and try and figure out how you can solve their problems as well. But you need to know yourself really well. And we touch on no-go zones. Um, sometimes that's really important to do right up front so you don't do that as a conversation in front of your prospective partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't want to be arguing at the board table whether you will or won't <laughs> support uh, an initiative that involves bottled water or gambling or alcohol. Absolutely. When you haven't figured out whether that's within your limits of tolerance or whether it fits with your values or your mission 
as an organization so you could let a great opportunity go begging if you can't actually decide um, whether that's right for you first and it also makes it a lot easier if a prospective partner raises that and you go no that actually is not for us and this yes. is why we're not involved in this uh, we're not promoting pharmaceuticals as a um, as a uh, solution to this particular sort of mental health issue for example mm. uh, but we do do this mm. so you're able to just tell your story a lot more effectively as a result look at uh, your your situation your offer we've talked about knowing yourself as a charity knowing your your situation um, now as we've discussed, you probably do know yourselves to a certain amount, but it's uh, this process really should get you thinking as critically uh, and, and carefully about what you do and, and what you then can offer. Um, but once you've done that, once you've looked at yourself in a way, there's also a need for the charity, for you as a charity to, as, as we say here, stand outside itself. Thinking about the corporate, um, that that you may be looking to try and partner with. What are some of the things they might want that you can offer? How can they benefit from a partnership with your charity? This this type of process provides some perspective uh, for your charity, and, and it helps you make uh, any pitch that you put forward um, far more, I guess, relevant, uh, far more uh, knowledgeable as well. Um, so, you know, perspective and insight, as it says here, um, you don't want to be the world's worst speed date. Uh, you don't want to just talk about yourself. You, you've got to be able to have some idea or some insight about what a, a prospective partner might might want, don't you? That's right. That speed date analogy is, is absolutely <laughs> perfect because uh, you, you always need to check yourself and go, how often have I talked about myself yeah. in this conversation versus asked you anything? <laughs> And sometimes it's really disproportionate um, and you need to just sort of step yourself back a little bit. So I think initially when you're, you're first out there prospecting, you're getting to know new prospective partners. It's really what we call a discovery meeting. Mm. So hopefully you'd have done a bit of your desktop research before you get out there because there's a lot of publicly available information on businesses. Mm. It's amazing how much you can actually get from yeah. their annual report, their website, what other people tell 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 you about them, sometimes they're customer reviews as well, so they're very insightful. So let's assume you've done your desktop research and you've got an idea that this might be um, a prospect for you or someone that's actually aligned to, to what you're doing or to your values. Then the next piece is really a discovery meeting that enables you to test that assumption, mm. to test your research and push that a little bit further. Now, most businesses I know, when you ask them to describe their business, We'll go on for hours about it. They're yeah. very happy to share lots of information about what works for them, what doesn't work, what's their, what I call the squeaky wheel, what does keep them awake at night that's not, it's their problem that they're trying to solve as well. It's just about asking those questions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if your entry point might be a, a cold call, you don't know them, you might also test whether they're the right person for you to be speaking to. And if not, could they suggest someone who is in the right area? Yeah. Or if it's a warm introduction, let's say it's someone from your board or someone from your network said, I think you need to go and speak to Chris. He knows all about these things. Then you're testing that and you're developing that further. So you'll be asking lots and lots of questions about what's important to them, what their strategy is, where their priorities are, what their timing is, yeah. where their budget cycle is. So are you talking to them at the right time? And also it's an opportunity for you to just insert some key messages about your organisation, about great things that you're doing at the moment. By the way, that reminds me of the new program we're about to run out. I'm mm. happy to tell you more about that. What you're trying to find is points of synergy, points in common. In the same way that you're, if you're on a date, you're talking about your favourite food, your music, <laughs> what do you both hate, yeah. Justin Bieber, all of those things. You're trying to find things in common. Yeah. So this is not dissimilar to that, but you need to actually ask those questions and just resist the temptation to, to talk about yourself for the hour. Yeah. We um, obviously, well, the next slide here, we've, we've started, I guess, chatting about the idea of choosing a partner and, and that sort of stuff and the, the idea of um, alignment. So, I mean, if you're... You know, when your groundwork is laid out, you know where your charity is, 
you know what you want out of a partnership, what you can offer as well. Obviously, the next step is to find a partner. Now, that can be a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, it can be quite daunting. We're not going to sort of be dishonest here. It can be. Um, now, approaching a business out of the blue can be a bit scary as well. And this is, I guess, where we would perhaps uh, say that, you know, turning up at the front door of a, a large glittering uh, corporate might not be the best way to go. Uh, it's, I guess the idea here is to have at least a bit of a look at where your charity's existing relationships lay, uh, where, where they might be and, and perhaps where you can take some of those, um, those relationships. Um, if, for example, there's a, an individual in a, in a business that you know that might be a, a bit of a, a supporter, a champion, uh, someone who's got a bit of experience with some of your services, uh, they might be a good place to start. There might be uh, a business that, you know, the, the people have already volunteered with you uh, as well. Uh, that might be another option for you. It might even be just a business that um, has warmed to you, that you know, they know you. Um, you've already got a little bit of a, a relationship there with them. Um, that might be a, a good starting point as well. Um, and. These are the sorts of things we talk about when we when we mention alignment, uh, approaching someone you know and, and perhaps using the networks that you have. Um, talking with people that are already familiar with your charity, uh, that you've already got sort of a little bit of a hand on the doorknob or a foot in the door there. There's a relationship there, there's a bit of familiarity uh, and, and that sort of thing is, is, is really important. Um, and as we say here, there's an opportunity here for charities and SMEs. Um, as you mentioned, Linda, SMEs often are untapped or undertapped, if that's mm -hmm. the, if that's a term. Yeah. Um, smaller charities, let's be honest, you're more likely to to know small or medium businesses, or at least have some familiarity with them. Um, businesses that are located in the same place as your charity, um, you're you're more likely to know them or know about them. Um, they could already be supporters. They could uh, have natural links to your charity. Um, that they're not a bad place to start, are they, when it comes to this type of thing? It could sound really scary, Chris. The idea of you know, cold calling mm. with a large a large corporate in that sort of you know expensive foyer. And the answer is you're not you really don't want to be doing that. Mm. You really don't want to be doing that. So you'd be amazed how many warm leads you can actually get out of your database, whether it's large or small. Because people often mine their donor database or their relationship database for individual gifts, yeah. uh, whether it's large or small. But they don't think about the connection of that individual. So they don't, they think about Chris and your capacity to give more than your $20 a month. So we'll go and I'll give you a bigger ask and mm. ask you for $500 a month. But they haven't thought about, well, actually Chris runs a large business. He runs a big furniture removal business that's yeah. national. Have we actually asked him whether he wanted to bring his business along? And it's a different conversation than an individual gift. Yeah. But if Chris is the founder and the owner, why would you not use that warm lead, that that lead to someone who already likes your organisation enough to give to you mm. to actually have that further conversation? That's where the, the value of sort of like tapping into SMEs comes. A lot of your introductions can often come via your leadership and your board, mm -hmm. so tapping into their networks as well, so that your board member can make a warm introduction via email or in person or even better, come along with you to the first meeting, saying, "Here, yeah, I'd like you to meet Joe. Um, let me introduce you. I'm, I'm already uh, a big supporter of this organisation. I can talk for it. I can yeah. be a big advocate for it. Let me make that warm introduction. Because the worst situation you can be in is emailing info at corporate <laughs> with a yes. proposal and hoping it lands because it never goes anywhere. No. It never goes to the right person. And you can imagine how many thousands, especially the larger corporates, might actually go. It's it's not coming in with a proposition or a relationship or an introduction. Yeah. And I'd also in, uh, get people to investigate their groups of volunteers yeah. because often community organisations really function on a very wide and very committed group of volunteers. Now, sometimes there are businesses, mm -hmm. sometimes everyone knows someone else. Yeah. So tapping into those volunteer groups as well, if you don't have a particularly big database, can be another way of developing warm introductions to networks. Yeah. 
Now you can qualify that, so you know it might not be it might be the right person, but it might be someone you can call and say, "This is a person in this organisation I'm trying to get to. Mm. Can you make an introduction yes. from within the organisation? Use them as Even a connector better. in a way. Yeah. So it's a multi-step thing. It, you yeah. don't often get to the right person. Um, right up unless your board's going to introduce them to the, to the CEO or the, the board chair, which is great, so book that meeting. But it just takes a little while to actually get to the right person that you need. Yeah. So use those networks and um, don't be afraid to you know, ask those questions and ask for referrals. And sometimes too when you're looking, uh, you're looking at partners, you're looking at small and medium enterprises too, their, their ability or their uh, I guess, so special skills, I suppose, in a way, um, can often shape what might work as a partnership as well. I mean, you mentioned before, it's all fine and good to ask poor old Chris for 500 bucks instead of 20, but if Chris runs a business that can help you, then that can shape a partnership without even, you know, without even a sort of a, a second thought, all of a sudden, oh, well, yeah, hold on a second here, we can actually get in and we can actually work with him in a certain way that will help both both of our organisations. So that's another thing to, to think about, um, the, the model itself and how who you talk to might help shape that as well. And also to, to be an open mind that who you're talking to might have their own ideas yeah, yeah. as well and have something rather than you come up with the whole thing and here's a done deal I'd like you to buy into. But allow them to have some input around, well, what do you know? Mm. So in that example I gave of that place-based solution where they were trying to create a more family inclusive environment for young families. Um, the organisations drew a lot of uh, insight from the local real estate agents and developers mm. who are building all these new housing estates yeah. and seeing who's coming in. And they were also working to influence them, saying, could you put more green space into your development? Can mm. you allow for that, that funny, awkward, triangular corner plot? <laughs> Can we make that into a playground? There's always one of them too. <laughs> you know, there's always that, there's sort of, yeah, the last things. And, and you yeah. know, it, it's a, a core of where real estate and developers are trying mm. to um, you know, build more sustainable communities um, and also sort of you know, build more connection because they're, they're selling things, but mm. they also want to have you know, successful proof of concept when they go and build it somewhere else about what works and what made a really thriving community. So yeah. they had a lot of insight as to what are the demographics of the people moving in? Who is buying? What are their situations? Yeah. All of those things that really help to inform the project. Yeah. Now we touched on the idea of no-go zones uh, a few minutes back. Um, again, is part of the process here. You, you need to identify and, and avoid bad fits. Um, problems, nasties, uh, that you may not sort of think about initially that might go under the radar. Um, I know, Linda, you mentioned a couple of pretty decent examples in terms of things like, say, if a charity has a problem working with someone who might have gambling on their agenda or might have alcohol on their agenda and that sort of stuff. Um, what, what are some, or maybe you've got a, uh, an example as well that, that might get people thinking uh, as well because it's amazing what if you dig a little bit below the surface what you might find uh, yeah that's right and that's where not just your desktop research but sort of uh, talking to people really yeah. helps and where in that discovery meeting you can flush out a whole bunch of things but also it's uh, it's worth having a detailed conversation spending a bit of time with your own organization doing that first yeah. because it might be really easy to determine what the absolute no-go areas are. So you might say, we don't deal with tobacco companies mm. or anyone doing pornography mm. or armaments. Yeah. So they're kind of you know some big ones, or you might have a view on gambling or alcohol, for mm. example. It's easy to kind of go, these are my absolute red flag ones, and we wouldn't touch those. Yeah. Then there'll be another category, which is kind of your amber list, <laughs> yeah. where you go and go, under certain circumstances, we could, or maybe with parts of their business, but not others. Yeah. So you might think about a partnership with Woolworths around promoting fresh food and, and health benefits of eating mm. um, fresh produce rather than processed food, for example, mm. or fresh fruit for kids mm. might be great. And then you think about, okay, well, what's my level of appetite for dealing with an organization that doesn't do just fresh food, but has um, alcohol outlets, yeah. he owns 
uh, lots of alcohol outlets mm. and it's also owns and a lot of pokey machines yeah. Yeah. and gaming operations so mm. how big is it as a part of their overall income yeah so what's my overall tolerance is it five percent of their income is it less than 50 yeah and these are sort of nuances that you really need to think about with your team mm. and that's a conversation you have not just amongst your fundraising team but all of your team and your leadership mm. and build a framework for decision making because sometimes one of these companies may well come to you and go we've got this great idea mm. yeah i had a um an organization that was about promoting uh, taking a break from alcohol yeah and an alcohol company approached it yeah, and said, actually, fine. we want to do a special of low alcohol and no alcohol beverage um, for this time. Mm -hmm. um, can we partner with you? And they really thought about it yeah, because yeah. You know, they're, it's all about, they're all about promoting more responsible consumption of alcohol and understanding mm. uh, the impact of addiction. Mm. And they really did think about it. And they went, you know what? I know the intent sounds good, but all of the other things that come with this very large alcohol company aren't actually worth it because it just compromises our values yeah so have those sort of conversations in that that amber um category yeah. and also build yourself a framework for decision making because you may have a, a clear set of who you will and won't partner with but does anyone in the organization know who has the final decision of course yeah and you could yeah. go round and round for months because no one actually knows who has decision rights on it. So let's think about how you escalate that decision. Who has the final decision on something that might be slightly contentious yeah. or a little bit controversial or some sort of risk? Put it in a formal policy and formalise a process for doing that. Yeah. Now, if uh, talking about formal policies and that sort of thing, um, now. We might have our we might have our partnership model. We might have even found our partner at this stage. Uh, our ducks might be in line. Um, defining the agreements now is it good enough to just have a verbal understanding or a handshake agreement? Given that this slide is talking about written agreements, clearly we don't think that's good or best practice. Um, a written agreement really offers some structure here. It's 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 a document that's set out uh, between partners uh, and it defines and gives direction to to a partnership. Um, it aims the roles within it, the tasks it aims to complete. Um, written agreements provide the opportunity to, to set out and detail the terms of the partnership. Um, as it says here, um, expectations, you know, deliverables, um, timeframes and, and, and responsibilities. Um, they, they keep things on track. Uh, and, and this is when we look into sort of the, the not just the short term, but the medium to longer term as well. And this is where uh, I guess their, their value of, an, of a written agreement um, comes out. Uh, it can be a reference point um, for the future. Um, we, we mentioned here, Lindo, how you know, agreements sort of keep track and, and provide triggers for future partnership direction and, and decision. Um, how does a charity go about writing or, or putting together these types of, of provisions uh, into an agreement? Well, firstly, I'd say that a written agreement is really important mm. because you don't buy a house on a handshake and and why would you do that with a partnership? Yeah. And also, if you think about uh, the length of the partnership, if you're intending this to be a longer term relationship, then things change within that. So people change. If you think about the average tenure of a CEO of a business, it seems to be three years and getting shorter, especially if you're working <laughs> in the banking industry. Yes. So people change at both ends. You could move and then where's the history of what you actually agreed? So yeah. having everything in writing is an absolutely basic requirement and it doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be a 50 page agreement um, and you get some expensive law firm in it. It can be just a really simple template that everyone agrees to, hmm. but it has to have some really fundamental pieces. And I call it a, a schedule of deliverables, which is a fancy way of saying, can you describe what's going to be delivered by whom, when, yeah. and how frequently? Yeah. So that everyone knows what's their bit in the partnership yeah. and how often and who's doing what. It helps, it helps because subsequent conversations it may evolve and then the relationship manager or the, the charity um, staff may change. 
the person sitting at the other end in the business may well change and no one's got a history of what was what was going on there so that schedule of deliverables which is just outlining the terms of it is really important one other thing that's really important is to build in at least annually a review of the partnership yeah to make sure everything's on track have you put some measures in to know that both of you are actually hitting your targets that you actually if you said we are going to have a partnership that enables access to financial literacy for 200 people in this area has anyone measured it and can you yes. tell you, do you yeah. can you tell you've got there or maybe you got there really early and go well, okay great what about the next 200 yes um, things change at both ends um, and also you know great example for for you of how corporate arrangements change the ownership changes mm. businesses merge businesses become new businesses and what might be um, a really innocuous partner um, that I worked with once which is an engineering company that got taken over by a big American multinational that did all sorts of things like um, armaments for you know, the defense forces mm. bombs yeah um, those type mm. of things it doesn't really kind of fit you know the the engineering company and the children's charity didn't really fit with a large armaments company no. so it provided a, a trigger point for being able to say this no longer fits our values yeah. um, and therefore that's a break clause and you yeah. can exit that before it potentially does damage to your brand and reputation yeah. so it always helps just to have everything written really clearly everyone knows where they stand and you can always have reference points that you can come back to not just to to check in with each other but also to celebrate success that you yeah. achieved what you said you were going to achieve yeah and we've um mentioned break clauses we've mentioned reviews and um these are, i guess are going to come up again in the next couple of slides um we look at uh, you know, maintaining maintaining the partnership um written agreements are obviously a key part of that um, but partnerships are lot like, like a lot of things um, they need maintenance uh, to do more than just survive um, to thrive to grow and and to maximize the benefits for everyone involved and, and the wider community um, here we've listed some of the things you should be doing towards this type of maintenance again as Linda's just mentioned regular reviews are an obvious way to keep the partnership uh, spick and span and, and looking good and functioning well um, reviews can be as you mentioned before the annual review they can be regular catch-ups even as well there's I guess a review element to that um, talking and communicating is is key here you know um, knowing what's coming up on the horizon um, expectations changes goals all that sort of stuff um, so yeah partners should really uh, schedule regular catch-ups regular chats um, it keeps everyone communicating talking on the same page um, fosters relationships builds relationships um, but there's other things as well that can be part of the maintenance process um, one idea is is the idea of value adding uh, the other is that there are again that we mentioned before triggers that might uh, see a change in direction as, as well um, when we look at value adding what 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 are we talking about here Linda well, firstly, that uh, that conversation, that ongoing conversation, is really important. Um, so don't wait to the annual review yeah. um, to tell someone that something's not working or that it's slightly off track. So make sure it's a, an open dialogue between yourself and your partner. Then I'd encourage everyone to think about what other pillars of activity, as we call them, mm. can this this um, partnership potentially yield. So it might have started off like my example you know where you shared some premises and then did an initial piece of promotion what else could you do think about other things that could work with this partnership yeah. it might be volunteering it might be some joint advocacy you might get on so well that you might invite some of your partner to actually be on your board yeah, yeah. you could potentially offer some of your um, really expert staff as speakers mm. to a particular event let's say your business Chris you know Chris Inc um, is having its 10th anniversary wouldn't it be great if you say you know we, you know we really value the partnership you know we can lend you our latest expert in yeah. um, youth employment to come and talk to you about all the great things we've done together it could be 
research and measurement. So, mm -hmm. you know, this has been a really successful partnership. Look at what we've achieved. How about we then put some evidence around it and tell everyone else about it and think about how they could maybe employ the same concept. Yeah. And uh, just some really simple things about, do you invite them to events? You know, if you're having um, a celebration thing where a lot of your young people have graduated from your program, have you thought about inviting your corporate partner to come and share in the success? Yeah. Don't keep it all to yourself. And, and that sounds like really obvious, but gee, that's something that you can overlook really easily as well. It's, of course, they should be there. They should be like the first people invited, but it's very, very easy to overlook that sort of stuff, isn't it? I think it is. And it's just something, sometimes the simple things, and, and it could be introductions to some of your key staff or ambassadors, mm -hmm. or sometimes introductions to your other partners, because bringing bringing the partners together, if you've got, let's say you've got a suite of the different partners, they love to talk to each other about what they're achieving yes. yeah. and feed off each other and get ideas in the same way that if you're managing individual donors or major donors, getting them in together in a giving circle often stimulates a lot of thinking and a lot of inspiration. So in the right circumstances, it could work really well with your partners as well. Got a little phrase here up on, on this slide here. Um, ensure everyone understands the key components to maintaining the partnership and then include them in your partnership agreement. Now that's, again, a key part of maintaining the partnership as you go along. Now we get to the, the last bit. <laughs> um, partnerships are gonna end, the everything ends, I suppose. Uh, and you've got to be prepared for it. You've got to have a process in place um, so that when the time comes, it's it's clear what needs to be done. The process is, is well defined. Um, again, that should be put in a, a, a partnership agreement at the start. Uh, now, some of the things we, we look at here, um, if there are review points, uh, agreed on end triggers, um, all the wind-up processes, uh, notice periods that, that might be in place. And the last one, I'll stick my head up and say that I reckon this is really important, is any reporting on the partnership, any storytelling that you might have. Um, some of the successes, some of the learnings um, and, and that sort of stuff. When it comes to that sort of thing, how, how can you go about that? I mean, you can put a bit of a report together, you bung something in an annual report maybe, but um, how important is it to just not wind up and walk into oblivion, but to actually say what you've done, say what you've achieved, tell people about it? It's so important to the relationship. And if you expect to have an ongoing relationship with them yes. or to have other successful relationships for which you love this one to be a testimonial. So sometimes it's not just about reporting on what did we do with your money? Mm. This is not just an acquittal report. This is about, did we set goals originally for this partnership of what we were going to achieve together? How many people we were going to feed? Mm. Uh, how many young people educated, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of it, can we tell whether we've been successful? And have we remembered to celebrate that success? Yes, that's right. As yeah. well, because everyone loves to celebrate success. So allow your partner to do that too. Mm. And what did you learn from it? So in, in the course of the program, did you, learn that not only did young people want employment, but they also needed uh, life skill training, for yeah. example. And so this is how you might go forward or how you might inspire others to, to come on board to do that. Um, I think an important part in the agreement is to agree on the measures that you're going to collect and who's going to collect them. So sometimes it might be your partner that's collecting them. You might encourage your partner. Let's say you've got a partnership with a retailer who, um, philanthropically minded, but they also want to drive more foot traffic through their stores. Yeah. You'd ask them in the agreement to collect that data so that at the end of say three to five years, you go, how did it go for you? Did it work? Because you want to know if their foot traffic went up by 20% yeah. as a result of the partnership. Why? Not just because you want to celebrate their success, but also you want to take that as an example to other partners to say, look what Absolutely. we achieved for Chris's business we could potentially do this for you as well. Yeah. Well, here's yeah. a great example of um, what really worked. So agreeing on that measurement, the data collection, um, being clear on the impact for both parties and not forgetting to celebrate those successes. And the end of one partnership in, in that way 
is a way of almost looking at it as a starting point for the next one. Here's what we did, here's how it helped the business, here's how it helped the community, here's what we achieved. So when you go to the next partnership, you've got all that information there and it's ready to convey to your next prospective partner as well, which becomes uh, a, a decent selling point, I suppose. Exactly, it becomes yeah. your evidence bank yeah. of you are a credible partner, you've clearly got some testimonial, you've got some great outcomes, uh, you may or may not be working on with that partner for whatever reason, or you may have taken it to a different project mm. or a different initiative with them, and then here's the next opportunity. Yeah. Now we're, let's see, we're about 10 minutes away from one o'clock, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna whip through the next couple of slides a little bit quickly, but um, it's probably a good point, and here you can see up on the screen, and thank you, Linda, for, uh, for adding to our presentation with this slide. Um, a bit of an, uh, an idea, a bit of an outline of um, the engagement cycle of, of a partnership. Now, again, probably a good time, don't go scribbling. Uh, these slides will be available on the on the website. The recording will be available as well. So if you keep an eye out at um, acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars, um, you'll be able to get this information, uh, including this slide and all the other slides and the recording and all that sort of stuff. So um, don't, don't fear that you might have missed anything. Um, and I would say, once you, when you look at that engagement cycle, mm. don't freak out. There we go, we'll go don't, back to don't it. Make, don't make, it's not too hard, it really yes. isn't. What it does is just give you a step-by-step -step way of building a capability for corporate partnerships. Yeah. So that each one of them is not hard, it's not particularly long, but it's all the things you actually need to think about. Um, and it's probably a way of me saying, if your boss says to you, just get out there and make 50 calls a week. <laughs> Show them this yep. and go, well, we haven't done any of these. Yeah. First. So it's not likely to be successful if we haven't actually built uh, built all of these steps first. So for all of you out there with like really difficult bosses, show them this one first. <laughs> all right, now we've gone through, we've got about 10 key points to remember. Now we'll, I'll whip through these relatively quickly. Um, these are sort of the key takeaways when it comes to your charity and partnership. So um, let's see, we'll start at the start again. Um, corporate partnerships, again, they're not like any other types of fundraising. Uh, partnerships can transform your charity. Think about the total value to your charity, to the corporate, to the community. Um, be strategic. This is a, this is a relationship we're, not, we're talking about here. It's not just a transaction. Um, a good place to start is with the familiar, those who you may have relationships with, um, who you know, they might be donors, they might be networks. Um, have, some, have some perspective and think about, about what you have to offer and who might be interested. Look for alignment uh, and put solid foundations in place. Again, build those foundations before you go too far down the track. Written agreement, we've emphasised that a few times. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you get that, uh, get that up and going. Have some clear goals and some clear expectations. Um, again, they can be included in that agreement. Um, maintain and nurture the relationship, and there's a number of ways that you can do that, which we've which we've gone through. And finally, have a have a clear exit strategy or end strategy um, in place, and and have some triggers there so you know uh, you know the the points at which you might have to uh, wind things up, and and the steps involved in winding things up. Um, oh, questions, there we go. Um, we've probably, he says, looking at his clock and realising it's about five minutes away. We've probably got time for one. Now we've, this one, and I'm gonna highlight this one because it was asked by a few people um, in the lead up to today's webinar. So um, I'm just gonna have a quick look here. A few people are interested in knowing if you've, wanting to get involved in a, in a partnership. What would make a charity from an ACNC perspective non-compliant uh, um, when it comes to uh, a partnership? Would it affect charity status, that sort of thing? Um, I guess briefly, any behaviour that would threaten a charity's compliance with, with the law, with ACNC requirements, state and territory regulations, um, the same sort of stuff applies when it comes to partnerships. Um, you need to comply with the law as a charity. 
got to be you got to be honest, be transparent, comply with governance standards, uh, all of that, all that sort of thing. Importantly, and perhaps I guess most specifically here, um, a charity's involvement in a corporate partnership must not see it breach governance standard one. Now, governance standard one, ACNC governance standard one. Um, states clearly that charities must be not for profit in nature and work towards the charitable purposes. If, for example, a charity's status as a not for profit is threatened through any partnership arrangement, that might become an issue. Um, similarly, if the charity becomes, for example, just a vehicle for partnership work uh, or, a, or a business enterprise in a way, um, there might be issues again. So don't let partnerships, I guess, run your charity. That's probably good advice, full stop, but um, ensure your charity runs the partnership in that way. The best way for a charity to ensure it's doing the right thing uh, is to continually ensure the partnership is well maintained um, and it's achieving things that are related to the charity's work and purpose and, and achieving things that are making uh, positive impacts into the, into the wider community. Uh, so that would probably be some, some decent advice there. Okie dokes. There's some associated resources on the topic. Um, we have a, a, a very useful partnerships guide um, at the address there. We also, also have a podcast featuring Linda and myself. So if you're happy to listen to us for a little while longer, we're, we're on that one too. Look, that's a, um, that's a really worthwhile listen. It's about 15 minutes, I think, of, of us having a chat about partnerships. It covers some of the same ground we've covered today, it covers some different ground as well. Um, so if you're interested in learning a bit more, there's some, there's some resources for you there. Um, stay in touch. There's always lots and lots of ways of staying in touch with us uh, through the ACNC uh, email updates, commissioners column, uh, through our various social networks um, and, and that sort of stuff as well. And our uh, address where we stash all our webinars is, is there on the page too. Um, it's about lunchtime, I reckon, if it's not already, except for those who might be over in the West. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for um, paying attention. Thank you for zooming through questions and, and your engagement and your interest. Um, we are going to hang around for a little while longer if there's still some questions to be answered. Uh, Brie and Matt will be typing away madly and uh, going through all the bits and pieces there. So if you've got any further questions, uh, quickly send them through or if you're more comfortable sending them through via email, education at acnc.gov.au. Um, thank you to Matt and to Brie for uh, going through and helping us out with the questions. Massive thanks to our guest today, Linda Garnett. Thank you very much. It was great to catch up again. Thank you for coming by. It's been a pleasure. And for everyone out there, best of luck with your partnership journeys. Um, there are plenty of opportunities there with businesses of all, all size and all types. So I do encourage you to just explore that and not miss out on those opportunities. Indeed. Um, Thank you everyone again for, for coming along. We'll let you get away and grab a bite to eat or wander and do something. Um, and keep checking back with the website. Uh, we'll have the recording and the slides and all the bits and pieces up in the next little bit. Thanks again. See you later. Bye.